Um, hello, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. And first of all, thanks uh, our Basel Hong Kong to and invite us and organize this panel. Um, so the topic for today is um, telling stories, and I think it, this is. Um, beautiful title. I think it is all what uh, our people are we are doing here. We are all storytellers and either curators we use in exhibitions or artists with a very different practice. And I think the goal is that how we're going to um, tell the stories and then to create this common universal experience to people from different parts of the world. Um, so when we um, we got an invitation, I kind of just take initiative and ask our panelists to select uh, uh, a work um, or some projects that to begin with. And so I think now, uh, today, I know this is more like a conversation based, but I think it was uh, kind of also important to have each of our panelists just spend some time to uh, introduce the project and the work they selected today. So uh, we were in the back room to kind of debate the order, but uh, I think it's very important to have ladies first. And, and I think the first we would like to invite Alice Wong um, to please just uh, share your stories about the project that you select today. Uh, with well, the slides is uh, looping, so um, it's at uh, all four uh, panelists' work, and so it's not specific which one is which, but I think uh, we, can, we can just point a little bit, like when it comes to your work. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Abbaso. Thank you, Stephanie, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Wong Kit Yi. I'm a genetically modified artist, idea-wise. Um, I'm very interested in genetic DNA technology, Japanese manga, and um, the models of uh, ownership uh, and leasing. Um, so Faya uh, have us to introduce one of our solo exhibitions. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my solo presentation last year uh, at the Art Basel Hong Kong here. But before that, um, before I talk about my show, I want to actually talk about my studio space first. So last year, after six years of post-studio practice, I finally went to a space in Manhattan's Chinatown. And I want to um, actually talk about this banana man first. So um, he run a food stand uh, right uh, downstairs, right, right below my buildings. Um, and, uh, there was one day I was buying banana from him, and we were making, you know, small talk and stuff. And he was telling me that many of the landlords in Manhattan's Chinatown actually don't give, like, any kind of official rental contract on paper to the tenant. Um, and I thought, oh, this kind of. Um, but he said that well. But he said that for sure that they still maintain a good business relationship for that case. And that is, I thought about that, and I think. This kind of like invisible contractual relationship seems really interesting. So, um, of course, like for for Chinese culture, uh, the concept of face minzi is very important, right? And um, it worth more than a piece of paper. Eating someone's, I mean, eating one's word look really bad on them, and um, I think it causes like huge damage on their reputation and social currency. Um, so. I thought, uh, you know, and I was trying to understand, you know, what a promise could mean over a very long period of time. What if we have a contract that lasts for uh, 99 years or 999 years? What could that mean? Um, you know, let's say if we are entering a contractual relationship today in 2019, um, it might probably not mean the same in 2118, right? So. Um, Unless, I don't know, unless we have the elixir of life, uh, the original contracting party would be dead. So uh, how should I think about this type of project and how should I tailor that? Um, so now let's actually move forward to my uh, presentation at Abaso Hong Kong at the discovery session last year. Um, 
I was uh, basically asking the same question as Alice, you know, that Alice in Alice in Wonderland in the 19th century. The question is, how long is forever? Um, and you, you know, in genetic, uh, like genetics, legal contracts, us and our personal life, we very often uh, employ expressions like um, forever, everlasting, permanent, and even immortal. But the meaning of those terms changes uh, in response to different situations and circumstances. Um, so my work chases the columnum of uh, the history um, into the current biotechnological field, such as gene editing and reverse aging. So on site uh, at the project booth here last year, um, we have a DNA sampling station, and then we have uh, some, we have some drawings on the hinges. We have two uh, slide, uh, sliding boss fo photograph pieces. And we have um, a film that's structured in the uh, sing-along karaoke format. Um, but uh, you know, it's not just for sale. You know, I, I very emphasize this point. Um, my project is not just about selling. So there's two different ways that um, the visitor uh, can acquire the work. The first one is that um, you can, you know, of course you can buy them outright and own them forever. Uh, the second, the second way is that um, you can also wind it on a 99 years uh, list, um, preserved in a paper contract, um, and also on a string of DNA that that is that is going to last for 700,000 years. Um, so we work, uh, we actually work with a group of. We work with the scientist, Dr. Lam, who, who is also here today, uh, and his student from the City University of Hong Kong uh, for this project. So we invite the visitor to um, extract their DNA by uh, uh, the uh, chi swap. So uh, we, prepare for, uh, we prepare the PCR product for them. If they want to uh, send it off for the DNA sequencing, they can do so. Or um, if they want to keep the DNA as an object, they can also, you know, store it in the freezer um, because we tell them that DNA can live forever in, in the freezer if their freezer can last forever. Um, so I think it is very important for me to explore uh, if that is possible to have this altruist, alt, altruist, altruistic exchange within the affair contest. And, you know, what does that mean for artists like our, our age or our generation to go to an art fair? Is it just about money? Of course, we do need the money to support our art practice in long term, but what does that really mean? Good, thank you. Um, so just to give a little um, footnote, says, um, I, I ask each panelist to give more uh, elaboration about the research process in the app because later when we uh, have the discussions, this is a part of how artists um, translate this large amount of information during the research would be uh, kind of the questions that we would like to exchange later on. So as the um, one's practice, it's more like a creating the situations and then using like quantifying things as intangible and then using to a different kind of a uh, medium or so whatever it's to adapt to that and I think this is kind of nice to follow up with Zach's presentation that um, the works that Zach uh, selected today is how like you visit the histories of culture but you kind of proposed uh, with the objects in a very more uh, poetic and metaphorical way to reimagine it so um, could you please elaborate some of the projects um. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think um, I could talk about this, uh, well, here it comes, this Bird of Paradise project, which um, we were talking about a bit earlier. Uh, as you can see there, this is kind of like the first iteration of this project that emerged from uh, research on uh, how, these, how these birds became a first form of currency between uh, European explorers and uh, uh, indigenous Papuans uh, of Papua New Guinea um, in the 16th century. Uh, the Papuans would uh, preserve these birds uh, by removing their feet and um, in order to kind of uh, keep the, the plumage fully intact. And 
Um, and of course, this information wasn't relayed to the European explorers. And so when they came and traded uh, uh, these these objects and brought them back to Europe uh, at a time of enlightenment and um, kind of empiricism, they were they were looking at these specimens and going, well, why do these birds have no feet? Uh, and this is really where the name originates from. And um, an interest of mine is, is, is how, yeah, is how we inscribe the world. And so this inscription to say, well, these, these are birds of paradise, um, i.e. they uh, only uh, exist in a kind of heavenly realm above the Earth's surface and they're perpetually in flight. So they never, um, uh, they never touch the ground until they, they fall from the sky. And, uh, uh, and this kind of, I guess the story to me was like a, a kind of hard-boiled um, example of uh, exoticism or like of making the other. Um, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to trace this kind of mistranslation, um, this moment where like a, a gap or an absence of information becomes a kind of uh, a generative or an even problematic um, service of kind of worlding or, or making um, imagining another place, uh, another animal, another um, an other, um, and so what I did initially, w uh, this was a few years ago now, 2015, I think it started, um, was to reprepare uh, one of these birds in accordance with how they were initially traded. So it was a already kind of taxidermy 19th century um, bird of paradise in this kind of uh, very animated pose, uh, kind of speak that speaks very much to kind of a, a certain, uh, I guess, fashion or trend or um, way of kind of mapping uh, the natural world in museums and natural history museums of the West. Um, so I reprepared it, yeah, in accordance by working with a taxidermist from a natural history museum in, in Wiesbaden um, to remove the feet. Uh, and and that was that was kind of in in some sense like one stop of the project. But I returned to it uh, with a separate work where I then I had the feet, of course, themselves severed from the body, and I laid these onto a cyanotype, um, uh, a, a photographic process uh, that is I'm sure we all know as like blueprints. Um, so I laid them directly onto this photosensitive paper and they made this photogram of the kind of ghostly absence of the, the feet, the legs of the, this bird themselves. And then I transferred that into a kind of infinite pattern for a wallpaper. Um, so it's this blue wallpaper that uh, has kind of rows of these, these legs rotating both clockwise and anti-clockwise uh, and is kind of dizzying and in some in some ways, kind of um, between falling and flight, uh, and in a sense, kind of evidencing this, I guess, gap or translation or mistranslation between between worlds. Um, uh, I mean, I, I guess there is many many other things I can talk about in terms of, I guess, these meteorites and shell pieces, which is what I showed last year here in, in the discovery section with my gallery, Michael Lett. Um, uh, but maybe we can kind of extend that into a further conversation about, yeah. Thank you. Um, and now I would like to invite Vivi um, to talk about this particular work that she select. And this uh, exhibition that um, the work that she uh, work with a very specific uh, material, uh, the lacquer, and then kind of represents the, the cave and the bricks with a kind of religious setup, but actually the work is, has nothing to do with the religious. Um, could you please elaborate that a bit? Uh, yes, hi. <coughs> well, I chose this work because I thought that the, when I, I, I understood that the, we were supposed to discuss a solo exhibition as a monograph. So um, yes, this work, um, well, just to give some context, uh, I work with a traditional medium um, that is considered traditional, but was uh, reinvented. Uh, lacquer as a craft was reinvented in, as a painting medium in the 1920s in Vietnam. And it is in, within this tradition that I work, lacquer as image. So um, when I first 
arrived to Vietnam. Um, I was my, just um, I was born in the U.S., but my parents are Vietnamese, so lacquer painting was a way for me to understand, to come into contact with Vietnamese culture and to get to know the culture. But later afterwards, after working with lacquer for many years, it, for me now it's an agency, a way of um, you know, speaking to the culture. So that's why I wanted to choose this work to, to talk about how a monograph is important because it's a way of speaking for the artist. Um, this first exhibition, um, as, I, as I came into contact with lacquer painting, I found that it's a deeply philosophical practice, but at the same time, there's not, um, there isn't very much written text or theory as to how an artist is supposed to go th about to conceptualize a work in lacquer painting. So a lot of the first exhibitions that I did was a way to uh, sort of invent a theory of working with lacquer or invent a way of working with lacquer, um, learning from contemporary arts and also taking um, strategies from postmodernism, deconstruction. So as to construct a narrative to work with this, lack with this medium. Um, so the work that I wanted to talk about is called Specula. It's a, um, it's a lacquered space. And it, it, when I first thought of how to make a work like this, there are many difficulties to overcome in terms of size because to create a lacquered space, it's a scaling up of the medium. So when it was invented, it was sort of modeled after oil painting. So you always think of lacquer painting as a, as a, a, a canvas. It has to be canvas size. So scaling up the work into a space also connects it to the past, but also there are many challenges to, to, to overcome. Um, so I... Having thought of the, creating a lacquered space required a lot of research in materials and research in techniques. And so um, I started to work with the different um, surface materials, epoxy and um, yes. But also after creating the space, after having the base, I, I came into problems about like what to paint. You know, so, how do you make a, an image? Like, how do you make a lacquered image in, a, in inside of a space? So um, instead of going back to the tradition of modernism, I, I decided to go back um, to an earlier point. So uh, so I, I became inspired by cave paintings, and at the same time discovered that lacquer painting has this capability of um, uh, for realism for organic materials that no other painting me medium has. So for me, at the same at that point, it was very interesting to to experiment with how to create a lacquer image without modeling it upon oil painting, but sort of creating an image without tension in itself. Sort of let the process create its own image. So um, inspired by this idea of like the first human mark making, uh, the interior of this work became sort of just kind of grew out of this idea of like stone and cave, and how the process of lacquer, of layering on silver, gold, leaf, and sort of, and, and sanding away, uh, sort of, is a metaphor for sort of the geological process of, of, of the formation of a cave. So in a way, I find it to be um, not only like realism in the sense of oil painting, where you're trying to create an, create an optical illusion of stone, but there's something about it that makes it become the, the stone in, yeah. Um, so the work is um, a tunnel with, through which you walk, and then the space is lacquered, and the lacquer painting is of is, is a realistic representation of stone and um, with some human mark making. Yes. Thank you. Um, and the last one, um, Basam, and choose actually a film work but we will not be able to see the film itself and but the film it's um it's on basem's website it's 20 minutes on a very beautiful six millimeter uh projects um so maybe basem you can tell us a little bit the narrative of this fictional story of the film and then how did that come about um i was doing a residency in a small town in uh in Quebec, in Canada, and every day I passed by uh, a, an unused hockey arena that had a big dent 
on its facade, and the facade didn't make sense. Uh, the, the dent on the facade didn't make sense, its height, its size. Um, and I, I was there for a month, and I saw it every day, and after two weeks it became annoying that I, I was asking myself how this could have happened, and the only thing I could think of was possibly a wrecking ball. But um, why would someone try to use a wrecking ball once and then stop? So I kept asking people, and uh, at some point towards the end of my residency, someone said the circus was in town once, and it, it they happened to do the circus uh, to to have the circus inside the hockey arena. And while the elephant was entering the arena, it decided to bang the facade with it with its head. And I was really fascinated by this story. Um, I had also just bought my first 16 millimeter camera and I started shooting footage without really knowing what I would do with it and as soon as I heard this story I starting I started kind of fabricating this um, this layered fictional narrative in my head and I started writing it um, so the 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 film ended up being named after the dent that I saw and it's the only thing that's actually uh, real in the film the rest the rest is all fiction uh, the film starts with the story of a small town where people wake up one morning and they decide that they want to accomplish some sort of international recognition. Uh, they apply to host the Olympics, but that doesn't happen because they partied the night before the committee arrived, so they were not ready the next day. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> at some point, they decided to buy giant dinosaur eggs that were uncovered in the Amazon, uh, but then they discover that they are um, concrete mixers made out of steel. Um, and at some point also their mayor decides to hypnotize them with forgetfulness, so he brings the circus to town, and that's where the story of the elephant also starts running parallel to this narrative, uh, where the elephant wakes up also one morning and realizes that he's becoming a zebra. So. Um, and that is because the the owner of the circus had a, had a had a dream, and in his dream he saw elephants uh, dressed as zebras. So he asks his clowns and their wives to um, paint black and white stripes along the bodies across the bodies of the across the body of the only remaining elephant in the in the circus. And the story the the two stories start run, running parallel to each other. And at some point, the people of the town have to make a choice between accepting failure or between keeping on trying. Uh, they decide to accept failure and to reenact everything that their ancestors did. Um, and the elephant sees itself, sees its own reflection in a water puddle, and it decides to bang its head against the facade of the arena. <laughs> Um, I really encourage everybody to go uh, watch this, uh, look at this film on Vasim's website. So I think maybe the audience would be slightly confused that uh, it seems like the four panelists all have very different uh, practice and they use very different uh, materials and how they construct the works and have very create different scenarios. Um, because I think, and then I asked them to spend time to talk about these narratives because uh, to understand an artist, how they come about the final visual form, the final results of the work that we see either in the exhibitions or out there. This is the long process that the artist needs to go through. That's how to construct uh, these narratives from the large information uh, that they have received through during the research process. And so, and then you can come up with the decision that either you want we want to make a 16 millimeter film or we want to make an object or we decided to have the whole solo exhibition. Exhibition is always a specific uh, material that we're using. This all takes a, uh, it's a very interesting process and that the, art, uh, the artists need to make that decision from the beginning. So, so, um, it's a couple of weeks ago when we started talking about discussing this uh, uh, panel, I asked each of them to choose a solo exhibition uh, as a starting point because 
solo exhibition, which I feel that it's a place which you can cater in the audience, uh, the artists to be able to have their narratives to, to have a more way to elaborate. Otherwise, the representation sometimes would become too opaque, uh, becomes too abstract and not be able to understand that. So I think it, it's uh, as we just uh, listen to each uh, of the uh, artists' presentation, I'm curious to when you start with the large information, how do you decide that to put how much information inside? What was the tangle? What's the decision making in the process and then to go to that uh, final visual form? Uh, would artists always have this insecurity, not putting too much information, or this is we don't want to reveal too much of it? So um, maybe we can use the, uh, the example that you select um, to maybe share a little bit of the producing process behind that. So for example, Basin, in, in your film, uh, this, uh, this, this, the sound and the text and the image, actually, it doesn't really translate each other. It has this very fictional uh, form of it. So I'm wondering how, when you come about with this whole research, how did it come about? This is the way that you want to narrative the film. I think it didn't have much to do, or as much to do with research as much as it was part of a development of my work over the few years before that and the films that I made before. Um, this was a very uh, critical film for me because it was the longest film I'd ever worked on at that point, but it was also the film where I started having a better understanding of the complexity of, the, of each one of these layers. Um, and one of the things I became interested in and kind of more, um, became more crystallized in this, in this film was that the, the, what you read, because it's all subtitled, uh, and what you see and what you hear don't have to exactly describe or translate one another into into something that that is that is just uh, something that we're used to uh, so the meanings don't have to be the meanings that we're used to that um, and for me the way this works is there's there are always they always hint to one another um, so there are always points of intersection, but I try to make them as subtle as possible that the brain can can notice them, but then you, hopefully, viewers can try to fill the gap in between them with their imagination and somehow to situate themselves inside the film, that the film somehow becomes about them. They become protagonists in it. They become you know, maybe inhabitants of this town. They they start thinking about their own personal interpretations of collective failure, of what it means to be part of a generation that goes through a specific moment um, where there is a lot of hope and everybody knows what they don't want. But once they get rid of what they don't want, everybody has a different idea about what they actually want and how to do it. And I feel like this is something that collective failure in different in different forms in different ways happens to every single generation but we're always we always feel like we're too unique and too different yeah. and too smart yeah. to accept that this has happened to people before yeah. um, and to me that was this this idea of of layering so the the sound is also layered the image is layered uh there are a lot of double exposures but also i i used for for this film it was also the first film that i used this process where i would take some of the 16 millimeter film stock and i would pickle it in acidic household chemicals and it changes the color of the film but it also adds another layer it's almost as if there is the image that i'm filming but on top of that there is a dominant color with some dots and drips and 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 certain marks and of course because it's film so they move and it feels like it's an abstract animation on top of the image um and then there was the the text which to me i i tried to write it in a more poetic way um and i don't i don't believe that any of these elements could survive on their own. I feel like this is, to me, when I when I start working on a film like this, it's more of a composition. It kind of evolves together at the same time. 
I shoot the footage and then I look at it and I write in response to it and then I go back and I shoot more footage and then I, I keep going back and forth and eventually when I feel happy with whatever I shot and whatever I wrote, I start editing and that's when the soundtrack starts getting composed. And I do all these things by myself so it feels very personal and intimate somehow. Um, so in the end, I think when I came to the point where I decided to leave these gaps between the three elements. It was a very conscious decision, but it was also risky, and I think it took it took maybe a couple of films until it evolved to the point where I got to the dent, where I felt, I personally felt it was successful, where people could relate to it. Um, and one of the things that I find that, that I didn't expect, but also found interesting about this film, because I made also a conscious decision to not use this, the voice of a narrator and use subtitles, because I wanted to eliminate all the, the kind of baggage that comes with that narrator, whether it's male or female, the accent, what kind of accent, the language. Um, I didn't want to situate this town anywhere that, that uh, you know, that could pinpoint it to a certain culture or a certain history. I wanted it to be as vague as possible, as open as possible. And then I showed, the first time I showed the film was in, in Dubai. And people understood it and related to it in a very specific way that's related to Dubai, which is a very specific city. And then the next time it was shown, it was in Athens. And people started saying, but this is about, this. this is almost as if it was made about Athens. This is about, the failure, the economic failure, and, and um, this is us. And to me, I, I mean, I didn't expect for this to happen, but I was very happy to hear it because what I kind of imagined could happen was starting to happen with, with these gaps that I was creating between, you know, the elements of the work. Because you kind of create this, abst this abstraction, uh, this abstract elements, we actually create, kind of create another layer of common experience that people doesn't necessarily need to have specific contact to understand. But because in this uh, New Viva way, this uh, gap kind of open another door for that. But even, e yeah, but even the footage that I shot was, uh, I intentionally shot it, it was shot in maybe seven or eight different cities. Um, and I intentionally wanted to make sure that it looks familiar but unrecognizable. There's maybe one particular location that's recognizable. But I, I chose it because it was very futuristic and it kind of had all these connotations about failed futures. Um, but yeah, it, it was uh, it was important to make sure that things it's fictional, but it has to look familiar and 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 people could relate to it somehow without without knowing. I wanted it to be more of a human experience, not a film about a place. If it was about Paris or New York, you perceive it based on your perception of Paris or New York or Hong Kong. Whether you know this place, you've been there, you only heard about it, you watched a documentary about it we perceive what we don't know through our own knowledge of it. And I, I wanted to kind of eliminate that completely yeah. and make it about, you know, every viewer, who they are and where they come from and their previous experience somehow. Yeah. So when, uh, is there a hierarchy, probably not, uh, when the text and the image, I'm assuming that the soundtrack comes a bit later. So was when you're making the film, was there a conscious decision that the image comes first or the text comes first? Um, it's not really a conscious decision. It's more about the way I work. I shoot footage. I take my 16 millimeter camera wherever I travel, and I shoot footage wherever I go. And by that point, I was I was kind of very comfortable with shooting footage that I know I'm gonna use someday. It's not it's not random. Like you know, I'm I'm just going to shoot footage of this, and I don't know what I'm gonna use it for. True, I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but I know I'm going to use it. I know that this falls within my interests, that this particular thing that I'm seeing that I can frame and see in the viewfinder is something that could fit in one of my films. And so I always shoot footage, and then eventually, somehow, maybe I, I get an idea, or some of the footage triggers an idea, or I hear a story, like, you know, what happened with the dent, with the beginning of the dent. Uh, and that... Yeah, and that's how it starts. And then I look at all the footage that I have and I start writing in response to specific scenes. Uh, and then I go back and shoot again. And then I go back and, and I keep going back and forth. And it's actually, it makes it more, 
because it also a process that that happens over a period of time. So every film takes maybe six months to a year, uh, depending on you know whether there's a commission or uh, or it's something I just started and I'm waiting to get money for. But things change. I change. My life changes. The things I see change. So there's a, I always feel that change. I don't know if I mean I don't think it's important for people to notice that change, but it is important for me to feel that. I'm changing and my life is changing and somehow it's reflected in the footage. When I look at the films and I remember where the footage was shot, I have these memories of my life going by and evolving as the footage was shot. Thank you. Um, uh, Kay, um, so the work that you um, introduced and you mentioned that it was uh, sp had a specific uh, for the Abazol Hong Kong last year. Um, so would the invitation comes from an art fair uh, change or has any influence for you to make this a specific work? Do you have like special catering this context to make such, uh, such a piece of work? Would it happen in a different way to construct it if it's an invitation from example a nonprofit institution instead of uh, 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 an art fair? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier that, you know, I think, you know, the altruistic part, you know, the altruistic exchange for me, it is very important because um, it's like for sure that, you know, I think, you, you know, if people who has resources and they want to acquire the work, that's, of course, that's good for the artists because they're supporting us in a long run. But at the same time then, um, you know, what, does it mean for the other people to come and you know see the work? Can they also be a part? Can they also be collecting something? Um, that's something that I like to think about. Um, but I guess also for the content of my my work for the specific this specific project for Abaso Hong Kong, I guess I'm always like to do things that I'm really bad at. Like I'm very interested in the academic science and the pseudoscience. <coughs> Sorry, primarily because I did extremely bad when I was uh, little in all the science subject. So I guess I'm like I want to I want to learn it on my own, and I want to making I'm basically making it up now. Um, and the process, you know, um, basically, you know, the question is like, how do we edit done after we have so much research, right, for the for the project? So from my sometimes um, again is is different from project to project, but for this one, I think like I I tend to talk to certain experts. You know, I talk to um, I talk to scientists at the church lab in Boston, and I also talk to uh, people who are very ex <coughs> experienced. Ex um, they know a lot about the legal contract, and I also talked to one of my collectors, actually. He is also here today. Um, and through this conversation, I make decisions as well. And they also uh, inspire me to, uh, for the next step. For example, when I talked to my collector, uh, we were talking about um, earlier when, I guess maybe he, it doesn't really matter for him, but I thought it's really interesting that when he was telling me that, um, uh, the earlier in the like seventies, uh, a lot of Japanese collectors start buying a lot of impressionist painting, and they were really worried that the the certificate uh, get lost at some point. So so how they do it is they man they, they take the paper or the contract uh, the, the the certificate and put it at the back of the painting. So I thought oh that's really smart because they put everything together. So that really inspired me because when I think about my work. Uh, it's all about the contractual relationship, and it's all about um, the 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 contract part is really important. So how can I demonstrate that w within my artwork? So I've literally built a structure for the contract. There's a folder space that um, once the vendor who want to uh, list the work from me for 99 years, we sign the contract, and then we'll put it back to that folder space. Um, so I guess my process is like also super organic. Um, but I start to have this habit. Uh, 
again, I'm I'm really liking to go for something that I'm really not good at. So I remember when I was in grad school, my teacher, Jessica Stockholder, every single time he walked into my studio and she would say that, oh, I thought, you know, you're, uh, every time I meet you and, you know, you have all these really interesting stories to tell me, um, why don't you start writing it down and you construct some kind of narration and then you can put it in your film or video at the time. And I, I told her that my writing is so bad, I'm not going to do it. But after I graduate for a few years, I start to write my own script. And I think that's really helpful that when I put my really messy random thoughts onto paper or into word, that really helped me to um, organize that and structure my own narration. Yeah, I think in this maybe a uh, follow up with uh, all the panelists is that do artists need to uh, take into consideration when uh, when we go through this a large amount of research and it's particularly important when this get a chance to commission works, um, would the invitation uh, affect the way how we construct the narratives? Do artists need to have that consideration if this project is commissioned by uh, either a non-profit institutions or for one case is for catering for the Arbazo context? Because I, I think the, the, the notion of where these things are coming from addressed to very specific audiences. Uh, does artists need to take that into consideration or artists should be shut away from that? Um, of course, I mean, I think it's always uh, specific. Wherever you're showing, you you, you do have a very... Uh, uh, want to have a thorough process in terms of considering an audience and considering the time. I mean, I think um, one way I try to think about it is, like, in terms of, like, the quick and the slow or something. Like, I mean, obviously, if you're exhibiting in a context like here, there's a kind of a certain... Uh, attention span that you need to um, enter, and and I, I think with this, with these meteorite shell pieces that I was doing, uh, they were kind of on, on quite a small scale, so maybe they kind of drew you into a certain thing. Um, but uh, I, I like what I kind of um, feel was uh, part of that work was like that they're very easy to kind of apprehend in the first kind of instance, but of course like. A, a narrative can kind of really, really s like unfold like quite slowly if you're willing to kind of spend time with it. And um, and this, if I'm, if, if I haven't really explained it yet, but these uh, um, these works that I exhibited last year uh, here in the discovery section were these paper nautilus shells that um, are made by an octopus, a female octopus, uh, and they're extremely fragile, um, and they're kind of this octopus exists in, in pretty much all oceans over the planet and kind of uh, uh, in the spaces literally between national borders or territories. And um, I made nine of these works and, and each one of these was a unique kind of iron meteorite that was handcrafted to kind of fill the aperture. Um, so in thinking about Meteorites. I mean, there's 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 a whole other dimension of time there. I mean, these things are like uh, older than the Earth's surface it's itself, old, older than the Earth entirely. Um, the oldest of which I was kind of working with was like yeah, 4.6 billion years old or something like this. So it's like, and it's kind of the material or matter that you know scientists are using to kind of understand what the universe was like as soon as they can get as close as they can get to kind of like the Big Bang or something like this. So this process of like accumulation or um, uh, time is kind of is very much present in that work. But stepping back into a kind of analogy or metaphor, I think it's uh, um, yeah, it's it's important to be able to, for me at least, to kind of think in terms of these like quick and slow attention spans and um, and and want to kind of have a, a project or a, or a piece that can unfold in many different ways in many different times. I see you want to pick up a uh, buzzing use you were mentioning in Vex you think everybody has very different tactics and strategies when it comes to 
uh, how you imagine your works as narratives are being presented at the different settings. Um, so does artists need to have be cautious or concerning about that, or actually should keep the artworks separated from no matter which uh, the settings it should be? Um, I think in general, I you know it's it's very important to be aware of what context the work is going to be shown shown in. Um, we were I think we were mainly talking about about solo shows, and I what I what I had in mind was that it really depends on several variables. Uh, one of the biggest ones is the budget yes. <laughs> of the show. Yes. Um, but also the kind of space. Uh, the the architecture of the space, what what their what their audience is like somehow. I mean, it's not it's not something that I uh, that I always care about, but I I particularly wanted to bring that up because I have recently been a lot more interested in communicated with younger audiences, uh, what I call the Instagram generation. So I've been trying to, uh, I created a hashtag where I, whenever I have a solo show, I ask people to take pictures of the work, uh, shoot videos from the films, and change them in any way they want. I, I, I ask people to uh, paint on them, cross out words, add words, um, add emojis, do whatever they want on their phone, and then somehow create a... Uh, collaboration of a, a very basic collaboration of ideas and then they can post it on Instagram using this hashtag which is dear Bessem and that um, that way I can see what they did and it started from uh, a thought that I go to the opening and I, I install the show and then I go to the opening and then I leave and then there's two months where I have absolutely no idea what happens and I don't know you know, there's all those people who go and see the work, and I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know if they're thinking anything. I, I mean, I don't know if they're, if they have questions that need to be answered. So it's it's very basically a very basic way of starting a discussion when there is no other channel of communication. But I think it's it's mainly, uh, you know, I need to talk to a curator. I need to go and see the space. I need to think about the budget and see what I can do. And I think for me, the most important thing is to put together a show that's coherent. I most of the time like to add something new to make a new work or or even present the work in a way like different grouping groupings of, of works or present the work in a, in a way that in the end it doesn't get boring for me because I think that's also very important for me that I don't repeat myself and I don't do, like that the shows don't end up looking the same because I, I do this because I want to enjoy it, so I need to keep on enjoying it. Exactly. Uh, Phoebe, you were mentioning that the reason why you choose this project is that when we, uh, I first that asked a question about solo exhibition, you were very puzzled with uh, why is this such an, an issue with that, because you mentioned in Vienna you're mainly working with a collective and it's all monographic exhibition, so this is a kind of curatorial input or there's a theme, thematic to navigate the exhibition is actually a very different context I usually work with. So. Could you please uh, maybe elaborate more on that? Yes, um, I think that most people are surprised because when they see lacquer painting, there's something almost timeless about the medium. Yeah. So it seems, and also it's such a, um, the materiality is so special. People are always surprised that my practice is more like punk rock or garage band, you know, where you mm, do it against, you know, to push against something or you do it um, in your garage, you know, like as a as a way to just think about the history, but in your own terms. And so, um, in a place like Hanoi, where there are institutions like public institutions of art, but they're weaker. Um, most artists I find in Vietnam also work this way, you know, in, in not not so much with a curator, but to say something against something, and. Um, yeah, so I was also that's why I was surprised when 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 you said uh, like the uh, the economy of the solo exhibition, as though there is a like a normal way of working with with curators and with institutions because we it's not something that we often have easily in Vietnam. So 
Um, yeah, so that's why I chose this one, just to, to talk about how um, we invent our own tools and we invent our own theories and our own language of how to, do, how to work with a traditional medium. And then we put it up in a solo exhibition, but we, it's so like I said earlier, punk rock where you photocopy your own catalog, you know, and you, uh, everything is very um, art, alternative space. Um, it's like an alternative practice. And then eventually, um, after exhibiting this work, Specula, for the first time, then I was invited to a, 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 a lacquer triennale. So it was, yeah, a lacquer triennale. So it, this work that was once like punk rock in my eyes uh, was situated with the rest of the, tr like the rest of the traditions of, of a medium in, in Asia. And so that was interesting to see because that was also a curated show. And it was a show that, um, that spoke specifically about like national um, <laughs> medium. And I found it interesting to all of a sudden see the work that I consider very like, um, alternative become something representative of like Vietnamese lacquer. It looks like this. So, um, and I, I think that was enriching because from that I learned more about um, how other artists work with this medium. Because I started with this medium through this tradition of, of painting in Vietnam. And then uh, afterwards, uh, the third time I exhibited this work was at the Singapore Biennale. And that was interesting because uh, it was put in the context of other Southeast Asian artists, and then it became the work about identity. So that was like the curatorial perspective on 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 that work. Yes. So yes. So it's interesting to see that. Uh, I think Phoebe just bring up very interesting case of that one specific show or in an artwork. It's a narrative to kind of change and expand it when it's the, the distribution kind of going to a different context. So with the artist, because maybe this has happened in a very, from the hindsight that your work is suddenly put into different contexts and the narratives kind of changes. But when, uh, do you think the artist, is, you, you, would you take more initiatives if this particular work kind of travel to different contexts? Do you, want to change the narratives in a way, or do you want to add another layers because this is if it was gonna fall into another category? Uh, yes, I mean, I think also the way we think about our work grows with the way we, I mean, as we have experiences. So when I made this work originally, it was a, it was a studio, a work based on studio practice. So I, it was very instinctive. I, I created the space, it had to be a barrel dome. We had to walk it, there, there couldn't be any edges or like 90 degree angles and it had to be an enclosive space, uh, enclosed space and, and it was based on instinct that I made the work and then as I um, later had time, you know, I stepped away from a studio practice for two years and I, I worked on a, a master's in art and research. Then I had time to step away and think theoretically about what, what this practice was and what it me meant. And then I was able to see it in a different way. So later, I mean, speaking to people about this work after, like there was a before, definitely a before and after. Yes. So as I learned how to think about the work in other terms, um, it also allowed, like, allowed me to sort of be in a different, more contemporary space with this work as well. So the lifespan of the one work can kind of grow as time goes by and now as a different situations and in different timing. And it's actually interesting to see how the narratives or the context kind of from the very beginning and it has another afterlife uh, growing. And I think maybe Zach's bird, uh, pro sorry, the projects also has a kind of, you, you, you adapt to different presentations at the different contexts, um, maybe. Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a wallpaper, it is, is it's modular and it um, yeah can can be scaled to kind of fit uh, in various different settings. Um, but just kind of like doubling back to kind of I think a procedure or strategy or something like this in in this regard too is like um, thinking about this uh, Godard quote where he's like being asked by an interviewer like you know do your films have a beginning, middle, or end? Yeah. And he said. Um, uh, well, yes, but not necessarily in that order. Um, and in some ways, like thinking about the w the way the 
ways that we kind of choose to kind of situate our works in, in exhibitions or and through times and maybe those works like uh, form another kind of hybrid piece or something like from the bird to the wallpaper or something. I mean, it's um, there's always uh, this kind of unfolding of, of, yeah, of different directions or different um, different times for an idea or different for, for a project. So, I mean, I, I think it's important as well um, if I'm doing a solo exhibition that there are kind of multiple different entry points um, that kind of that maybe are actually telling different stories and, and it, it is kind of um, uh, there's a montage there which is kind of sets you up in a kind of procedure of looking right you're kind of like um, yeah tasked to kind of uh, shift through these different I guess multivalent kind of um, points points of access but yeah I think nowadays in the, our words that's this uh, urgency that we constantly need to produce a lot of either the, uh, shows or exhibitions or you know it's kind of difficult for even artists or curators to catch up with what um, the work can be because um, because the amount of things that are just happening that's so quick and then so that's uh, uh, the thing that it's nice to see um, if there's a chance that uh, the artworks is being able to take their time be able to grow and it has a different layers and different afterlife that do at the different settings so um, I think it now maybe uh, I would like to open a uh, question to the floor if people have uh, any questions to, to uh, our panelists today. Yes, please, Jen. Uh, thank you very much for your um, presentations. They're very interesting and it's quite a range of of work. Um, we've talked a lot about your process and your thinking and your um, research and uh, the multiplicity. What comes through to me is the complexity of some of your work and the multiplicity of, of ideas that you're trying to uh, juggle into um, something that ultimately becomes an, an object or a film or a photograph. Um, I'd, perhaps I could ask uh, Kitty, um, because uh, I know her work perhaps the best of everybody, but your work, there seems to be in my mind, it's not a criticism, <laughs> but there seems to be in my mind a lot of ideas that go on, a lot of research that go on. It's very far-reaching research from North Pole to ICE uh, archives to um, you know, all sorts of uh, projects that you, and experts, and then it comes down to objects that you create often as part of your work that are framed, that are captured in a, f in a, in a video or on a screen. Um, and to me, it's, there's a tension between the scope of your thinking and the, um, not finiteness, but the, the, the structure of your objects. I would like you to talk to me a little bit more about that and maybe other people as well. Thank you, Jane, for the question. It's always difficult <laughs> to answer your question. Um, I recently, I mean, uh, I think it's right because, also because we talk a lot and I, it's true that I do have a lot of ideas all the time, and and a lot of time, all these ideas are very complex. It's not very easy to answer in a simple way. Um, I think I put a lot of uh, work um, or the research or the thought in my film more than my objects, but the object is a way that to kind of draw the uh, the um, audience to come closer and then maybe if they spend more time they watch the film they will they will get a better sense of what I'm really interested in but also recently um, I start to think that 
maybe one of the uh, better format for me for now would be like a lecture performance because it's so much I want to say that sometimes I feel like it's almost like not honest for just like one object to be able to capture a lot of it. Maybe like some of it or a little of a little bit of my thoughts, but um, yeah, that's the things that I have to constantly think about. Um, but I also don't want to. Mm, I also don't want to just cut down the ideas because this is how I am. I just have so many different ideas here and there. Yeah. I think maybe this is a very vague question because it, we all have very different practice. But and all of you actually work with very different uh, mediums. It would be film. It would be um, creating a situation. It would be objects, and it's all very diverse. So maybe that's a kind of weird question. But how do you decide uh, when you come with a, a starting with research? How do you decide which um, medium you would like to use? How do you decide you want to make a 60 millimeter film? How do you decide this should be a, a, a contract to create a situation to invite people in? I'm just, maybe you would like, to, can you each of you like share just one idea? How, how, how do you decide it, which direction of this artwork should be? Well, I, I guess, uh I kind of maybe like to think about maybe exhibition making as a medium as well and uh and how I decide to do that and that and that's largely like what I do um as as in in terms of an artistic output is making exhibitions um I think I guess that there there is like a power or a, a threshold that's there for a gallery large like in in some senses that you know, I've always kind of thought it's the space that you can kind of cross that threshold and you can kind of let uh, this work that's in front of you like influence you as much as you might influence it. So it's this kind of like two-way street in terms of being able to like maybe unfold your own understanding or perceptions. And I think that like art spaces in general are like an incredible place like in our culture where we do get this kind of like back and forth potential... Um, I guess openness of like interpretation and that meaning is 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 never to rest in one place um, with making an exhibition. So I mean, I can address that in only in terms of yeah, exhibition making. I guess. Um. Um, for me, I find it impossible not to work with lacquer painting okay. because it's uh, ancient, but also very modern. I mean, it's it was reinvented. It's a new invention. So I feel like it's really interesting and almost impossible today to be a part of something, like to be a part of something new. I mean, like I feel like it's a new technology, you know, like I feel, um, yeah, it's, it, I feel like, it, like it's still possible to invent a genre of lacquer painting that hasn't existed yet. So I'm not there, I mean, but it's just like on the tip of my tongue or on the tip of my imagination. So yeah, I find that infinitely interesting. Yeah, you stick to the locker no matter what in that oh, case. <laughs> yes. Yes. Who has one? You want? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I think for me it starts with intuition. It's, it's just I get an idea and I kind of see it in a certain way, but also I think intuition is mostly experience. Um, the experience of working with the the different media that I've worked with before, but also the curiosity about working with something new. Um, but it's also functional sometimes. So sometimes I have an idea and I see it as, I see kind of progress in the way the narrative is being told. So I feel like it makes more sense that it's, uh, it's linear, it's time-based, but it's also layered. So it becomes a film because then it has you know, you, you see one image and then another and then another and they exist in a sequence and they can't exist otherwise. Uh, but sometimes I have an idea that would eventually become uh, a big photographic piece of 
64 photographs and some of them have text and narrative as well. So I, I had been thinking a lot for years about making an artwork about love, about a love story. Mm. And I was hesitant because it's, you know, it could be cheesy and it's, it's not something, but eventually I decided to do it and I had, um, I felt that I had a good way of doing it, but for this, I wanted it to be spread out, to be laid out in front of a person's uh, eyes. So I, I made 64 photographs uh, in a grid. Some of them have text. And you could see all of them together. So you see, so the text is also kind of a narrative that responds to a love story, a fictional love story. So it has some sort of a beginning and an end, but they're not in chronological order. They're mixed up. But the idea was I also wanted people to stand in front of this giant piece that's like five by seven meters and see all the elements, see all the parts of this love story and maybe also relate to something that that kind of responds to a love story that they've experienced. So it, I think it, it depends on a lot of things, but um, for me at least there is definitely always intuition. The idea comes with the medium in my head and I, I think about it and I stretch it and I layer it but most of the time I just go with what started. Um, is there any questions from? Yes, please. First one, please. Hi. Um, I have a question about stories. So, t so today I heard many, many nice stories, right? About the dent, the banana man, and cultural heritage, and birds without, uh, without wings, birds without. Uh, so, um, and, th and these are all fascinating stories. And, um, I've been to some of um, your works, and um, I have to say, to be honest, as a stu stupid man who is um, not an artist and not a particularly clever person, um, I've, I, I, f I find the stories even equally interesting, even more interesting than the work themselves. So sometimes in this, um, in kind of modern art, um, sometimes I would go to a gallery and uh, look at the work, and they're so abstract um, to a point of incomprehensible. Incom but not in a nice way, until I went to the opening, and then I talked to the, to the artist for half an hour um, over a glass of wine, and then I, f I, I heard the stories that inspired um, his or her work, and then um, I felt very really, really fascinated. And so my question is, like today, um, we need the stories, almost like the artwork are a way to kind of open up um, and kind of uh, make, make me receptive to Kind of a, a, a kind of a deeper story, um, but like 1,000 years ago or even 100 years ago, when the artists they didn't have artist statements, so they only have a painting, right? The only chance to inspire you is that painting, um, without even kind of um, letting you know who the artist was. So, so um, are we talking about a world where um, stories are more valuable than the artwork, or um, are the artists on the stage? Um, are you um, willing to kind of review your stories, or do you want to keep the story kind of as a kind of personal thing and never kind of um, 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 make your work so um, too, di too directly connected to stories? Well, I think 2,000 years ago, I mean, when you speak about one culture's work, it's we it, there's a it's it's a more it was a more homogenous I think um, culture where maybe I mean if you maybe if you look at Chinese ink painting or European Western paint Western European oil painting uh, it was easier to understand perhaps because we we have created the I mean the culture to or the stories that we share were more in common um, I think we live in a more fractured day and age where it's harder to communicate. Uh, to everyone universally, and I don't think it's possible for an artist to even do that, um, other than to suggest the story within the, I mean, it's easy, not easier, but it's harder to see a complete story where there's an epic painting that includes exact precisely what the story is about, for example, in one image. I don't think we have the stomach to see one image that describes everything. So I think as, as artists, it's hard for us and also, um, yeah, I think it's easier to work from a, yeah, a poetic point of view, or um, to think about the audience, uh, how the audience could live with, not live with this work, but could, how how to think about the audience, how they could see the work in their on their own terms, because 
there are many things that we don't share, especially from being from many places in the world. Um, I would also add that we don't know the stories behind the the great paintings that were created before, because the artists are not dead, are not alive, and maybe if they were alive, the stories would dwarf the works, um, and they would be a lot more interesting. But I think also. Um, if I wanted to make art that sounded just like the stories that I tell about it, then I would work in TV or I'd make mainstream movies. Um, I think that to me is the interesting part that I'm doing something that is slightly different from the way things are told in, in, in real life. That's why I think of what I do as fiction, and uh, that's why I personally was talking about these gaps for the imagination. I think that's one of the most important things that art does is spark the imagination. Let's us see things in new and different ways, ways that we're not used to. Um, so yeah, that's to me, that's that's the answer to this, I think. Um, I I agree what you what you mentioned. Uh, I think also, um, of course, now you you hear us talking about our stories, but then we actually didn't know the story, or at least I didn't know about my story at the beginning. You know, now I can tell you because I make the work. When I'm starting making the work. I didn't know what I really want to do. You know, that's the beginning of me trying to look for that future stories. And if I already know the story, I, I don't want to just illustrate that. I think it's boring to just illustrate something that you already know, right? Um, also, I don't know, I like to, sometimes I like to think that, uh, you know, people will ask, you know, you make fiction, how would you call your work? You, you make fiction or you make like, how do you name that? Yeah, I think of it as fiction. Fiction. It's fiction that responds to reality. Yeah, um, so I, I like to have my own genre. I like to say that I make like a fantasy, fantasy documentary because I'm looking for, I'm not interested in science fiction. I'm interested in academic science because in the real world it's already, there's so many really, really strange things that we just didn't know, you know, until maybe the artists highlight one of those stories and then you think that is really interesting. Yeah, I think it, uh, the stories, individual art context, it's, it's not like writing a novel or like Badan said, it's, just, it's a very linear narratives for you, but it's, I think it's about to creating this common experience it even is in a very abstract form, but people can feel that even it's by a painting, a film, or anything. But it's I think it, it's about the power of artists. It should be to translate that kind of common experience, and then no matter which language you are speaking or which context, which culture that we are from. Um, I don't know if it can be <laughs> an ending for our panel today, so because I think the time is a bit running out, so. Thank you for all the panelists and thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.